rolling. What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Unconventional Money Moves. I got Ken Schmidt here, the founder of Turning Point Executive Search. He's been doing a lot of recruitment and he has an interesting background. I found it interesting that he has a bachelor's in economics because hiring matters, which he's also the podcast host of. And being that you have a background in economics and knowing that the unemployment rate is very important for the economy, what is it about hiring that matters, Ken, that people may not be aware of? Yeah, well, thanks. I appreciate you having me on the show, Josh. It's good to uh, to be here and have a, a great discussion today. You know, hiring is so important. I mean, I think it's one of there. There are so many different facets of business these days, but your people, human capital, is without a question the most important part of your company. You can have a, a brilliant, you know, amazing, life changing technology out there, but if there's nobody to actually execute on it, to build it, to deliver it, to market it, to sell it, um, then you know hmm. you're 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 kind of dead in the water, so to speak. Um, so hiring matters is something that we use. It's it's kind of of a, a philosophy, a theme that I've used throughout my 28 years of recruiting. And so we use that as the name of our, of our podcast as well. But especially in these times where we've got, you know, a, a, a unique five generational workforce, which is very, very incredible and very fascinating. Um, but you've got five generations, each of which has a different, you know, philosophy on life, philosophy on business, communications, mental health, working from home, you know, you know, traditional education, there's a lot to unpack there. So it's a, a pretty exciting time to be in the, in the recruiting and human capital world. So we got boomers, X, millennials, Gen Z, which one am I missing? The, the oldest of the group that you didn't mention, which is the, the greatest generation. The greatest there generation. Still, there are still yeah. a fair number of folks that are in their mid, late seventies and early eighties that are, uh, that are in the workforce. You know, is that the forgotten of, generation or is that the one above president? them? I'm sorry? Is it Are they the forgotten generation or is that the ones above them? I can never remember. The forgotten generation? You know, I've heard that term, but honestly, I don't know which one that, it might be the same. I'm not sure. It might be one of the same. Sometimes we as, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer and we're the smallest of all those cohorts. So I, I consider us the forgotten generation because there's so few of us. <laughs> yeah. And with like hiring, um, hiring has definitely taken the main stage in the economy because of this thing called the uh, SOM or SOM or I don't know, SOM indicator that someone said if there's like an uptick in unemployment, it -hmm. leads to recession based on historical data. But what happens in the past doesn't mean it's going to happen in the future. Um, What are you seeing now with like hiring and being on the uh, front lines with everything? What are you viewing in that capacity? Yeah, well, as you mentioned at the outset, I was I was an econ major in in college, and you know the the joke among among you know economists is that you know they they you know predicted ten of the last five recessions. <laughs> so you know economists are always saying that oh, use this trend, look at that number, look at that, and it's going to definitely predict this is going to happen. People have been calling for recession now for the last twenty four months, and it hasn't happened. So yes, you're right that that particular metric, you know, what as it's as it's tied to unemployment does tend to indicate that at some point down the road there's going to be a recession but you know we haven't we haven't seen it quite yet um but in terms of of hiring and i think you know it's it's the 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 when i mentioned before about it being a really interesting time to be in the human capital recruiting space it, largely because of covid you know the trends that we all saw out there over the last you know let's, let's call it 36 months you know maybe three and a half years give or take um Those trends are the trends that you usually see take place over a decade, over a 10-year period in terms of the slow rise, the slow fall, increase in compensation, you know, things happening with minimum wage increases. All the things that happened were really condensed and compacted into a very, very short time frame. And as you might expect, it's really played havoc both on the company side with them trying to figure out what the right kind of hiring, not only in terms of types of people, but also volume, what is the right level of hiring? And then employees trying to figure out what should I be asking for, right? Minimum wage has gone up dramatically in a lot of states over the last 36 months. And rightly so, it had been you know, greatly diminished for a long time. Um, but if you look at, you know, if you look at the, the increase in profitability you know, prior to COVID, so up to 2019, you know, the the, uh, the average uh, company had an increase in profitability year over year of 13%. Over that time, the same time frame, that same previous year, 18 to 19, the increase in compensation was only up by about six and a half percent. 
So COVID hits, everything goes kind of crazy. Hiring is put on hold. People are furloughed. Companies are trying to figure out, can we even survive? Then we start to come out of it in late 2020. And then all of a sudden people are, are saying, you know what? I've been here for three, four, five years. I haven't gotten a decent raise in forever. I'm doing the job of two, three, four people and I want to make a change. And so lo and behold, then you have this, you know, this crazy, you know, the great resignation of 2021 which shouldn't really have surprised anybody. So there, all these things are happening in a very short amount of time. And that's really played havoc with what people are doing and how they are, are projecting forward in terms of their required headcount. So how, how have things transformed since then? Well, I mean, it's, it's every, I keep saying that every quarter is like a different year. Um, it's, it's, it's such a different trend. So 21 and 22 were record hiring years, record years for M&A activity, IPOs and SPACs and private equity firms and all that just went through the roof. And then mid 22, it just kind of fell off a cliff and companies were trying to figure out, okay, now what do we do? We have all these extra people that we hired, many of whom were, were great hires and some of whom probably we don't really need now. Then you started to see layoffs start to take place in late 2022 and throughout last year as well. And we had that kind of rolling recession where certain sectors were hit harder than others. We also had on top of all of that, the crazy supply chain issue where, you know, I'm here, in, I'm here in San Diego. And so we all have pictures on our phones of the, you know, several dozen container ships that were just sitting offshore in Long Beach, you know, just south of Los Angeles, because there was no dock workers and there was no, there wasn't enough people to actually unload the ships. And so supply chain was crazy. So that's now, you know, kind of filtered through the system as well. So nowadays, companies are being much more um, uh, deliberate and careful about their hiring. There are there certainly have been more layoffs this year than there were two years ago, but we're still we're still below the level we had in 2018 and 2019. So people always, always ask me, "How is the job market?" And I'll say, "Well, compared to what? <laughs> right? It depends on what your uh, what your benchmark happens to be." But so companies are being more selective. Employees that are currently employed, that are currently working, they're also being much more selective in terms of deciding if they if they are willing to actually change jobs as well. And compensation levels have just gone you know through the roof over the last couple of years. Yeah, that that remark you just made reminded me of uh, someone was interviewing Phil Mickelson, the golfer, and they're like, "How far do you hit your pitching wedge?" And he goes, "Well, I could hit it one foot. I could hit it." hundred yards. What kind of shot am I hitting? Where am I at? You know, the economy is always adjusting and evolving and no two years, especially over the last four or five have been even remotely the same. Um, now yeah. with hiring and everything being such a big part of how the economy is moving, what have you been seeing that was a good thing that came out of uh, the craziness of about four years ago? Like what's been the positive change with the hiring process? Yeah, I think, well, good question. So I think every, everything has a, you know, no matter what- There's gotta be know, at least one. Yeah, no matter what you mentioned, whether it's AI or whether it's minimum wage or whether it's the new generation, everything has a, a positive and a, and a negative. I would say that in in the aggregate, in, in broad terms, I think a combination of, of the new, you know, Gen Zers out there and the, the the work from home you know phenomenon that has really created a much bigger um, focus on work life balance, which is kind of a cliche, but another way to look at it is that you know mental health is so important. And we've all seen the research over the last couple of decades. It's not a surprise. You know, people that are happier, you know, that that feel better, that feel more confident, that feel acknowledged, appreciated, that they're making contributions in the office, they are happier people in general. And likewise, if you're if you're happy, if you're feeling like you're doing something that you that you enjoy doing, you're going to do a better job. You're going to be more engaged. You're going to be more empowered. You're going to come up with better ideas. You're going to collaborate more effectively. So I think this you know removal of of mental health as a taboo has been a huge plus, a huge benefit for organizations. Now, granted, I'm I've been married to a family therapist for 32 years. So I certainly have a bit of a bias about mental health, but regardless, I think that's, that is helping us to, as a, as a, as a country, as a, as a society, helping us to really see the value in employees beyond them, just being a producer or a number on a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the end of the day, we're all just people. Now we may have our, you know, our work persona and then our out of work persona, but at the end of the day, we're all just people. I was talking to someone who is a uh, boomer 
and they're saying, I, I was letting him know like, Hey, like my daughter got sick. So I just let him know like, Hey, my daughter got sick. I can't make this meeting. He's like, Oh, back in the day, you just tell him, Hey, I had to bring my car to the mechanic. Cause like talking about the family dynamic wasn't a good reason not to come to work. So it's pretty cool how that's changed. I definitely feel like that's a net positive. And I feel like that's interesting that we're in like a five generation workforce. Has that ever happened? Do you know? It has not. It has not. Yeah. Mm. No. Well, I mean, on, on honestly, because, you know, the, the the life expectancy has never been, you know, greater than it is right now. It, it took a little bit of a, of a hit because of COVID, of course, but um, we've never had that many people that are in the workforce. And usually, you know, up until the last, you know, 10 or 12 years, most people retired by age 60, 65. But nowadays, A, you don't need to retire that early because you have another good 10, 15 years ahead of you doing whatever gig work and whatever kind of economy you want to do. Um, but also because people are living longer, you really kind of have to work longer. So this is the first time we've actually had that. Uh, it's, 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 it's a, it makes it for a very interesting time frame. And I think, you know, to the to your question before about what else has come out of this, I think because of all the generations being working, you know, being in the same environment, working in the same, um, you know, uh, organization, it's also created the need for leaders to do a better job of managing remotely and, and kind of creating effective communication, not assuming that everybody on your workforce is going to communicate the same way. And that's that's a that's a big difference. And work from home has really kind of accelerated that. And I think it's it's also you know brought to the to the forefront the question of you know do we have to have a brick and mortar physical building for our organization to thrive? And granted, it depends on the organization and what you do as a business for sure. If you're if you're a biotech firm, you can't you know you, know, you can't create new you know molecules when you're working from home. But I think for I think last I saw something like 45 to 47 percent of of positions of functions can work from home at least part of the time. And pre-COVID, it was really hard to find organizations, you know, CEOs that would be willing to support that and allow their people to work you know, remotely or from home. And nowadays, it's much, much greater. Uh, and I think employees that are looking for work or that are open to changing jobs, they're much more selective. And it's, it's much harder as, as a recruiter doing leadership recruiting. It is very hard these days, A, to get someone to fully relocate for a job, even for a high level C-suite position, because they, they say, I don't have to be in the office every single day. I'll stay where I'm living right now and I'll commute if I need to. That's one thing. And the second thing is that, you know, companies have now have access to talent on a much broader, you know, regional geographic scale. You don't only have to get be, be limited to the folks that are in your backyard. If you find a great software developer or warehouse manager or whoever it might be someplace else that can do the job remotely, great. Now you have the ability and the power to access that talent pool on a much larger basis. So with the employees looking for work or being more selective, how has that been affecting the companies themselves? Uh, well, I mean, a, a lot of ways. I think, you know, A, companies companies have to um, be more flexible, for example. So we just filled, finished a, a head of marketing search for an engineering services company based out of the Midwest. And, you know, when we, we started the search, it's a company owned by private equity, um, you know, a good mid-market company, about $50 million in revenue. And when the, when the search started, they wanted somebody in the office five days a week. Well, that meant that we had to look at people that were in a very, very small radius from the actual office. And it wasn't a very, very large city that they were in. And we did our, our recruiting and we said, oh, great, well, we'll, we'll find some options for you as we usually do. And we brought them a great superstar candidate. They, they fell in love and it was a great fit for both sides. But this person lived about an hour and a half away from the office. Mm -hmm. And because the fit was so strong, they said, all right, well, we'll, we'll flex. We're going to allow this person to work from home two days a week and then commute in three days a week. So that's a great example of an employer you know, realizing that they need to be flexible to find this great talent. And also the candidate who wanted to work from home you know, five days a week, you know, she was, she said at the end of the day, you know, I'll, I'll, I'm fine to come into the office five, uh, three days a week because I'm so excited about this opportunity. It's a great fit culturally. So that flexibility is, is much more pronounced these days than, than it's ever been for sure. Um, and I think companies need to just understand the landscape, it, depending upon the skill set, the function they're looking to hire that, that, that candidate may or may not exist in their own backyard. They may be forced to go someplace else to find that person. And we, we do, we offer something as part of our solution. We, we call talent mapping. 
And this is really to help companies understand before they actually launch a full-blown um, campaign or you know, search to fill a position, you know, it helps them understand what does the landscape look like for that function? How many other companies in their competitive landscape are hiring the same position? What is the average compensation? Where do these candidates reside? What's their average tenure? So we do a lot of research for our clients up front before the search actually actually begins to give them a sense for what that that map looks like and i think because succession planning has become so important lately with you know with covid and companies being sold that you know that talent mapping is really taking off and it's, it's a big part of what companies are looking for how does that process go down within the company cuz sometimes you know even a mid level company there's so many there's so many layers like in order to get approval for that thing is that something hard for recruiters to do or is that something that you and your team have you know refined that process to you know set yourselves apart from all the other recruiters that are out there yeah i think it i mean i think it really comes back to communication right we we always tell our clients that we're not looking for a vendor supplier relationship we're not a commoditized product this is a a, a pretty unique solution that we are, that we fill, you know, kind of a, a solution that we provide and trying to find a human being to fit a position, right? And companies, we, we tell companies all the time, you're not going to find somebody that, that fits a hundred percent. There's going to be people that are, you know, 80, 85%, but we're not manufacturing a car. We're not building, you know, a, a software product. These are people. And so you can't mix and match skill sets. You've got to look at what's out there. So I think, you know, in terms of your question about how, how that process goes, you know, the companies that we choose to, to, to partner with, our clients, you know, that, that, that communication, that foundation of it being a very strong partnership is, is set up from the very, very beginning. And that's what helps us throughout the whole process to get approvals, to, for them to understand, hey, we're going to present you with a, a, a broad slate of candidates. Some might be really senior and a little more expensive. Some might be a little more junior and a little bit less expensive. And you'll have a couple of folks in the middle. And our goal is to provide them you know, a variety of options. So we present them four or five you know, top candidates. After we've screened 100, we present the top four or five. And then the client is deciding, okay, which one is the, is the best fit? So, you know, again, with that communication in place, it, you know, theoretically, it shouldn't be that difficult to get the decision made. Um, the challenge sometimes is you have too many cooks in the kitchen and you can't please everybody. So there's a little bit of, of fungibility there as well. Mm -hmm. With being, we are in a uh, moment in time where there's five different generations. How, how, how do we get this communication to be uniform across all these different ways because you have some people who grew up with literally the only way you could talk with someone is if you write a letter, you go to their <laughs> house or you pick up the phone. And then you have the other generation where you literally don't even have to open your mouth and you can have a full conversation with someone. Yeah. Yeah. I think it really comes down to, I mean, to your point a second ago, you know, we can't assume that everybody that is in uh, 65 years of age and older, we can't assume that all they want to do is just, you know, use email or write a letter or what have you. Right, because there's different forms of communication. And likewise, we also shouldn't assume that every 24 year old only wants to DM or only wants to talk through Insta or, or WhatsApp or whatever. There's a lot of variation in between. And so when you make those kind of assumptions, then you really, you know, you, you jeopardize the potential for more collaborative efforts and more creativity as well. So, I mean, it's a really, really simple answer to your question, but it just comes down to ask, just ask people, hey, how do you like to communicate? You know, when you, when you are, as, as, this is a, a good segue into interviewing, when you are a company interviewing a candidate, certainly you want to find out about their hard skills, technical skills, that's certainly important. But beyond that is not just what they do, but how they do it. How do they communicate? How do they collaborate? Where do, do they like to be the person that, that executes on somebody else's ideas and they're really good at that as a tactician? Or are they the ones that really thrive when they get to have the ideas? When they do create ideas, how do they do it? Is it in a Slack channel? Is it through whatever it might be, whatever you know, platform it might be? So having that conversation. And likewise, if you're a candidate and you're interviewing for a job, you wanna make sure you understand exactly how that company operates. How do, is it, everybody says they're open door. No one, no one says we have a closed door policy, right? That open door policy is just, you know, such a worthless phrase. 
But you know, how do you communicate? Again, is it techno is it over technology? Is it face to face? Is there a morning stand up meeting where you, you everybody meets for fifteen minutes once a day or once a week? Um, you know, what what are the different you know um, uh, Google shared docs that you use? What is that mode? Don't assume because your company is a very forward thinking, leading edge technology company that they're using the latest and greatest tools. They may still be using good old fashioned email. They may be using, you know, PowerPoint still, God forbid, uh, as opposed to something like Prezi or something that's more, you know, more advanced. So don't assume, I guess, is my quick answer to that question. And just spend the time to collaborate and communicate and talk about, you know, how we want to operate as an organization. Now, is this like something you created in terms of finding this perfect, not the perfect fit, because no one's a perfect fit, but finding right. that ideal person to come in and take over roles? Is this something like you created or is there some other tools out there that everyone can use? Walk us through that. You know, in terms of, I mean, it's, it's with all the technology out there, AI and everything else, you know, the, the industry of recruiting honestly hasn't changed all that much over the 30 years that I've been involved. I mean, yes, there are tools like LinkedIn and there's, there are some other AI screening tools or assessments for sure. But at the end of the day, it still comes down to that fit, that conversation. So mm. you have to understand what questions to ask as an as a candidate or as an employer, what questions to ask to get at the at the heart of what that role is going to look like. Mm -hmm. That's really important. And you, you you there's no way to bypass that. You can't replace that, you know, with technology. So as even though it takes time, you have to to get to get the right fit, you've got to have those conversations. And it also comes down to one of the, I mean to your question, one of the things that we I think have maybe not perfected, but that we are working towards perfecting is more effective interviews and more effective, you know, hiring processes as an organization. For example, a lot of times we'll have companies that will have, you know, an interview, let's, let's say it's a, a VP of sales position that we do a lot of. And, you know, the VP of sales is going to be interviewing with the CEO, um, maybe with the, the head of operations as well, the head of marketing, which they'll be communicating with, and then a couple of other peers in the organization. Well, most companies just say, all right, you know, okay, Sally, you're going to go interview this candidate. The candidate's name is Tyler. Sally, I want you to, to go in and let, let me know what you think after the interview. And then Todd, you're going to go interview Tyler as well. And you're on the operations side. So let me know what you think. And there's no guidance around what Sally and Todd should be using, what their lens should be to determine whether or not Tyler is the right fit. And, you know, what needs to happen is that you should be saying, okay, Sally, uh, you're, you know, you're on the marketing side. I want you to go in and I want you to look through the lens of marketing. And could you see yourself collaborating with you know, Tyler, this candidate for a VP of sales position and look at it that way. And then Todd, I want you to look, you're on the operations side. I want you to look at it. I want you to review or, or assess Tyler and determine whether or not he'd be a great fit for you on the process side. How would Tyler get along with the rest of the operations team? Is, is he more collaborative? Is he more, you know, more kind of uh, command and control or is he more kind of a servant leader? So companies need to do a better job of equipping their interviewers with the right script and the right lens and the right expectation. So then in the aggregate, when all the feedback comes back, then you figure out, okay, is Tyler the right fit or not based on all this feedback? Not just, hey, Tyler seems really cool. I could see myself, you know, having a beer with him after, after, you know, hours. He reminds me of my college roommate. His great sense of humor is pretty funny. He'll, he'll, he'll do just fine. That is not the way to assess a candidate, you know, for a leadership position. But as silly as it sounds, that's what a lot of people do. We just have our, our natural unconscious biases, but we, we, it's ingrained in our DNA from, you know, you know, hundreds and thousands of years ago to stay with and hang out with and be with people and, and trust people that look and sound like we do and come from the same background. And so you've got to break, find a way to break through that. I, rem I remember reading or seeing somewhere when Google was looking for their one of their first CEOs, they like, I don't know who it was, but they brought him to like Burning Man <laughs> in California. Right. I think, is that in California, Burning Man? It is, yeah. Yeah, so they brought yeah. him to Burning Man, like this is, my, this is our person. Um, and I thought that was an interesting way of like figuring out, hey, is this going to fit, especially for a company that has uh, transformed the world like Google. Mm -hmm. And with what you're saying, it seems like, what's like a good mix of having like the C-suite executives interview people, but as well as like having like people who they're going to be working with each and every day on the front lines conduct those interviews. Is that something, it sounds like that's something that's been changing because typically back in the day, it'd only be like the managers and then the people above the managers are like, all right, sounds good. This person can come in, 
We're hiring mm-hmm. 10 people. We hope four of them work out sort of deal. Um, especially when in sales positions back in the day, how, how has that been like evolving from what you've been seeing? Yeah. I mean, it really depends on the size of the company. I mean, certainly if you are Google and you're hiring a new CEO, the CEO doesn't need to meet, you know, a frontline software developer, right? That, that, that's a little overkill. So it depends on the size of the company and complexity, but, but yeah, I, it definitely is helpful to get another, another objective opinion, um, you know, from folks that may not you know, interact with that person very often, but still who understands the makeup of the organization, the culture, how they do things, how they communicate, those kinds of things. But again, back to what I said a few minutes ago, the important factor is that if you have a frontline or a more junior person interview, a, a potential new, you know, leader high, leadership hire, you got to make sure that, you know, A, that frontline person doesn't think that they have veto power. You know, a software developer is not going to be able to, to do a thumbs up, thumbs down on the new CTO hire. That's That just doesn't make any sense at all, unless you're a five person company, right? In, that, in which case you shouldn't be hiring a CTO anyway. But, you know, you got to make sure that that person understands we want to get your opinion. It's going to be one of, of many data points that we're going to fil- we're, we're going to filter in to just make our ultimate decision. So, again, that, back to that communication, I keep talking about it, but making sure that you're setting the expectation clearly in the very beginning. But overall, I think I think it does make sense whenever possible to have somebody be interviewed by certainly the folks that are going to be in their direct line of sight but also somebody who's going to be a peer in a different department. You know, a great example is, you know, when you bring in a VP of sales, you know, sales and finance have always kind of had this adversarial relationship over, over decades and decades, right? Because sales is always over promising. They want more headcount. They want to, you know, do whatever they want as far as budget goes and spend money. And of course, finance, you know, they're all about let's, let's save money, right? We're all about trying to, you know, work close to the dollar, as they say. Um, and so, but in companies that are, you know, small to mid size, those two folks have got to get along. Otherwise it's going to create a lot of stress on the organization. So there's a lot to be said for having the potential VP of sales candidate interview with, or talk to the VP of finance or the CFO and just get to know each other a little bit and understand each other's perspective. And that can be a good telltale sign about whether, whether the candidate's truly going to do a good job in the organization or not. Mm-hmm. How... How how does making that personal touch make a difference from what you've been seeing? Like, at what point do people make the interview maybe a little less formal? They're like, hey, let's go out and play bowling or go to top yeah. golf or just something silly, something that's like yeah. not business related. How important is that nowadays compared to when you first started? Yeah, it's 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 really important as a leadership hire for sure. Anybody that's going to be in a leadership position, I think that you need that for sure. I don't, I don't think you need to, I mean, and it depends on what you do. I mean, going, going bowling or playing golf or whatever, that's one thing, but you know, I always, I always advocate for our clients taking their final candidate before they've actually made an offer, taking that final candidate to lunch or to dinner and just see how they operate outside of an office setting. How do they treat the waiter or waitress? How do they treat the hostess? Are they are they ordering the most expensive thing on the menu? You know, are they are they still maintaining you know eye contact while they're eating? Are they drinking too much or wh- whatever it might be? All these things that you know people candidates tend to let their guard down when they they know they're the finalist and also when they're outside of the of the office environment too. And that goes a long way. We had when I was working at a at a, a very large uh, search firm a number of years ago. We had this great this great situation, or not great at the time, but it's a good example of you know a very large technology company was hiring somebody uh, into a VP of operations, actually SVP of operations position. And so we had the finalists go in, and he was coming from a very very strong pedigree background, and he pretty much had the the job you know kind of wrapped up. It was going to be his, and he was meeting with the CEO. He wouldn't be reporting to him, but he was going to meet with him. And for whatever reason, this candidate walks in in a more casual dress. And he literally has, he has a big wad of chew in his, in his lip, right? And he literally walks in with a, a, a empty you know, soda can. And as he's interviewing with the CEO of this company for this job that he you know, thinks he's got you know, all wrapped up, he's chewing and spitting. And you think, what possesses someone to do that? But you know, it, that was a pretty clear indication that this person let their guard down Right. They were definitely not the right fit for this organization. And so doing something in a more casual setting, you just never know what you're going to uncover by doing that. And so that was a good I always I always use that example as, as a way to say, hey, 
you know, it's it's a good idea to take 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 the final candidate out to a more casual situation and see how they respond. Yeah, because anyone can get a nice tailored suit, dress up, right? Practice. Then, especially you've been interviewing a lot of companies, you're getting a lot of the same questions over and over. And yeah, people can look good in one or two interviews, but the longer right. you uh, have your sample size of meeting with that person, then you change the environment. You're gonna see how they change with the environment that you're they're giving. So that's cool. Now, yeah. with uh, everything being so uh, different, are there like questions? when people are interviewing now that are just like no-nos to ask that people were just asking a few years ago, like how has that dynamic changed? Yeah, well, so certainly, I mean, the, the legality of what you can ask, you know, has certainly changed. And I would say that, you know, the, the, the laws that have been in place for a while now, there were, there were a lot more, um, uh, breaches of that law when I first got into recruiting, you know, almost 30 years ago versus today. But I'm still surprised when I hear it happens. You, you know, we'll get, we'll get feedback from a candidate that says, you know what, the interview seemed to be going okay, but then the the CEO asked me how many kids I have or what my plans are for having kids, or you know, do I how do I spend my time outside of work? Do I go to church? These are all questions that you're not allowed to ask, right? I mean, these, I mean legally, but companies do it anyway. Unfortunately, you know, a, a big thing that came up. This is pre-COVID. This is probably in 2018 ish was you know companies that were requiring um, candidates as they came into interview they were requiring a sign off on on a documentation that allowed the company to look at their social media feed back then it was mainly facebook we didn't have uh, what we have today as much but uh, it was mainly facebook 2017 2018 and there was a huge conversation that went on in the in the hiring and hr community about is that is that legal is that morally ethical to require a candidate to let you as an employer look at their personal social media feed as a deciding factor about getting a job. And so that, that changed. So then there was a, a, a lot of laws that were passed. I think now, I know it's here in California for sure. I can't remember if it's federal or not, but you're no longer able to, to um, ask an, a, a candidate, a, a prospective hire um, to show their, you know, personal, you know, um, social media feed. It's just, it's not appropriate anymore. Um, but I think it, it comes down to, there, there's so many great questions that should be asked that don't, it shouldn't be just, you know, you sit down for an interview and the, and the, the company says, so tell me about yourself. Oh, I hate that, that question. That, that tells you. <laughs> What's your background? About... What's your background, Ken? Tell me about yeah. your back. What background do you want? You want my, like where exactly. I was born? You want my educational back? I mean, it's just so like, it's I'm pointless. like, he's like an outside the box thinker. So when they ask that question, I've just learned to assume they just mean about work. Right. Yeah. Well, and, and it, it's not a relevant question at all to your point for that particular job. And so, you know, companies are, are have gotten better at this. There's certainly still a lot of room for improvement, but I've gotten better at asking more behavioral questions. And for example, we always tell our clients, you know, don't just ask these candidates what they have done and say, what'd you do at, at your last company? Uh, in this situation. Instead say, here's a situation that comes up at our company. This is what goes on. Here's the, here are the players involved. Here's the, the budget or the financial you know, risk involved. You know, how will you handle this? And give me several examples of that. So it's, it's less around what did you do and more like what will you do going forward and really painting a very realistic picture of what it would be like to work at that organization. And when you're asking that question, you're not just listening for the, the hard data that the person is, is providing in the response. You're also looking for their body language and you know, are, they, are they maintaining eye contact? Are they fidgeting? Are they putting their hand over their face? Are they folding their arms? Everything that really indicates whether or not they're truly either A, telling the truth and B, are they confident in that response? Is that really how they operate or not? Um, you know, if you ask someone a question, like, again, I go back to sales again, but if you ask a head of sales, you know, so tell me about the last three, um, you know, big sales that you had, how did, how did they go down and who was involved? If that candidate talks about me, 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 I did this, I did that, da, 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 and there's no we or team involved in that conversation, that's probably a pretty good indication that, the, that they operate that way. They're probably more of a lone wolf. And they're not going to be as collaborative. Now, if your company is made up of other lone wolves, great. They'd be a fantastic fit. But if your company is more collaborative and everybody works together, it's more of a team selling atmosphere, that person is probably not going to be the great fit. So you're looking for those kinds of key phrases, not just the specific you know, um, data that the person is using in their response. Yeah, totally. You got to figure out 
first and foremost, what it sounds like you're saying is you got to figure out what kind of person are you looking for? Mm-hmm. You know, because there's a lot of people, like if you're looking for a salesperson, there's lots of different kinds of salespeople out there. There's the salesperson that is, um, I was on a sales call with someone and I was like, this is like one of the worst conversations I've ever had. And I can't believe this person even has a job. <laughs> and then there's like other people you talk to, you don't even think you're like, you're just talking. You're just having a good right. conversation. But I guess it depends on what industry and what you want your company to look like, especially when you're in the scaling phase, because one bad hire could ruin a company, especially if you're not very large. Um, yeah. You, and one of the reasons that we specialize in doing a lot of a lot of recruiting and sales and marketing as well is that finding a good, strong sales leader is, is difficult. I mean, because sales leaders are in that role for a reason. They're typically very well-spoken. They're charismatic. They have a good sense of humor. They know how to build rapport. So all those things make you feel like it's going to be a good interview because that's what they do. Right. But you have to really, we call it kind of peel back the layers, you know, to really get at the, at the heart of how do they operate? Yes, they may speak well and be charismatic and, and people follow them, but only to a certain extent. What is beyond that? So you have to look beyond the, the you know, packaging, if you will, uh, to make sure that the substance is actually there. And I found it interesting how you could have like certain scenarios that you could give someone. Is anyone starting to use AI to come up with random scenarios? to give people to see how they respond. Has that happened yet? Or is that something, I mean, that's just an idea I had right now. I was like, Hey, you're coming in. Let's generate a random scenario for you. I don't know what it's going to be. Ken doesn't know what it's going to be. And let's see how you respond. Is that something that's happening or not yet? Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard any examples yet of AI. Um, th- those scenarios being created by AI specifically, I'm sure it is happening. Um, but I, in terms, in terms of, you know, doing a case study or a presentation, a, a, a hypothetical presentation on a given situation or sales process, or what have you, that happens quite a bit, whether it's a marketing role, this ha- we also see an operations role. We do a lot of operations recruiting as well. And certainly in sales, you know, how would you handle this sale? How, what, 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 what would be your goal and your focus in the first, you know, 60, 90, 120 days, those kinds of things. That's, that's been pretty common for a while. Um, and I'm sure AI is being used in some form or fashion. I just don't have any examples yet. <laughs> well, maybe we came up with an idea right here. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, sweet. Ken is the host of Hiring Matters. Go check him out there. You can find him on LinkedIn and he is doing a lot of cool stuff and super happy to have him on. Dropped a lot of knowledge here. So we'll see everyone next time. Bye everyone.